Everybody ready to go? Good morning. So the commission meets today all day long. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> back to school. Um, <clears throat> so the commission meets today uh, to discuss the NRC staff review and recommendations regarding expedited transfer of spent nuclear fuel from pools into dry storage casks at reactors. Over the last few decades, the NRC has examined the risk of potential spent fuel pool fires from severe accidents. This issue is important because the spent fuel pools contain a significant cesium source term and don't have the benefit of containment structures. Although spent fuel becomes significantly cooler after the first few months of discharge into the pool, there's still a period of, of time when it may be vulnerable to potential self-ignition generation of hydrogen and significant release of cesium if the cooling water were lost in the pool. Now the physics of self-ignition during a drain down event is very complicated and the arrangement of the hottest fuel in the pools in the racks is one factor in this uh, event, potential event. Now after 9-11 in particular many organizations uh, and the public have raised concerns about the vulnerability of spent fuel pools to uh, fires and terrorist attacks and now after Fukushima concerns have been rekindled again. The staff has recently completed a consequence study based on the spent fuel pool at the Peach Bottom reactor and in addition a more recent regulatory analysis that analyzes the need for expedited transfer of all spent fuel from US pools into dry casks, not all fuel but of a certain age. The staff has delivered a paper to the Commission that recommends that expedited transfer is not warranted and that the NRC does need, needs not pursue any further generic assessments in this area. So the Commission today is interested in hearing from the staff on the findings of their consequent study and expedited transfer analysis for all spent fuel pools. In addition, we're also interested in hearing from uh, external uh, groups and we're going to hear today from both industry and non-governmental organizations as well. So let me first say that um, I'm going to ask each of you panelists to keep your remarks to I believe 10 minutes. We have a great deal to talk about today so please pay attention to the timing lights in front of you and I ask you also to uh, try to avoid using acronyms. Um, to the extent possible, we'll allow NRC. <laughs> but uh, the public is, is you know, watching this and we want to make this as accessible as possible. So what we'll do is we'll have our first panel and then we'll have a short break and then we'll, we'll hear from the staff, okay? Let me first ask my fellow commissioners if anybody has any comments they'd like to make. No? All right. Then with that, I'm gonna turn to the first panelist. We have Mr. David Heacock, who is President and Chief Nuclear Officer of Dominion Nuclear. Thank you, Chairman Paul. I appreciate it. And commissioners, Happy New Year. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to express the position of the industry here this morning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the NRC staff has performed a very thorough, conservative analysis to determine whether it makes sense to remove the older or used fuel from the spent fuel pools or not. Uh, since the older fuel represents a small fraction of the heat load and a small fraction of the gaseous off-site dose consequence activity, it just makes perfect sense that the conclusion would be makes no sense to remove this fuel from the pools at this time. Next slide, please. The, um, in the case of all these 21 spent fuel pools that were studied by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff, they all experienced seismic events that were greater than their uh, design basis earthquakes. Um, in the case of North Ann, I worked at that plant for 25 years, very familiar with the design of the plant and the spent fuel pool. And it just so happens I've been to all these facilities that have all 21 of these spent fuel pools in the last uh, few months. I visited Kasurazaki, Karawa, Fukushima, Daiichi, and Daini in September. That was my second time back to Daiichi and Daini. And uh, you can see from Daini specifically 
that, that had essentially the same earthquake that Daiichi had. Daiichi had the hydrogen explosion. It's more difficult to determine what caused what, whether it was a hydrogen explosion, seismic event, tsunami, et cetera. Daini's a little clearer. When you go look at that, you can kind of discern what was tsunami, what was seismic event, and no hydrogen explosions, obviously. So you see uh, almost no seismic damage at Daini. Onagawa is actually closer to the epicenter, and the pools there survived with no issue whatsoever. There was some sloshing, minor amounts of water lost. So this is all very consistent with what we saw in the study that was done. No significant damage. At North End, the same thing was true. The you know, August 23rd, 2011 earthquake, there was no safety-related structural damage. There was some cosmetic concrete falling, some ceiling tiles falling, those kind of things. But we had an earthquake that was about twice the peak ground acceleration of the design basis earthquake in North Anna, right here in Virginia, August 23rd of 2011. And the spent fuel pool did not slosh, did not lose any water, did not lose cooling. There was really no consequence at all in that event. Uh, next slide, please. I thought I'd include this for a little bit of context. Some photographs here of uh, Kiwani, North Anna spent fuel pools, as well as the dry cast storage facility for used fuel at Kiwani. Uh, kind of point I want to make here is you can see, particularly in the Kiwani picture, really how small a pool this is. This is a single unit site, but the fuel cylinders are essentially the same dimension as a full size reactor. So the you know, left and right horizontal dimensions are the same, but it's only for one unit. You can also see the individual stand on the wall there to get an idea of how robust these facilities are. It's about a three foot thick concrete steel reinforced structure that supports the spent fuel pool lined with a stainless steel liner. And the NRC spent a lot of attention on what happens to the concrete and what happens to a liner. And uh, this is just kind of a way of putting it in perspective for you. Uh, the pools are about 40 feet deep. The uh, other thing to note here is that for Kiwani, we're in the process of going from an operating unit to a shutdown unit, a placing unit in safe store. As a result of that, we've done some of the same calculations that the NRC did in their consequence analysis for our Kiwani plant. It got essentially the same results. So our calculations agree very closely. We saw the same conservatisms that the NRC saw that I'll discuss in just a minute here. Next slide, please. Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4 is an example of how robust these spent fuel pools are. This was the fourth largest earthquake ever recorded in history. Uh, the building was damaged extensively by a hydrogen explosion as well. And as I pointed out, it's hard to say which what's what. You can see the Daiichi, you can't see the Daiichi because they were so close in proximity time-wise to one another. But the pool structure, operating deck, and all are essentially still intact. And the pool lost very little inventory, although there was a lot of concern over it, did not really lose inventory. Next slide, please. Analysis that was done for a peach bottom assumed an earthquake about six times their safe shutdown earthquake magnitude, very, very large size earthquake. So there's a conservatism to begin with that the earthquake chosen was very large. Even with that large earthquake that was chosen, which was larger than Fukushima Daiichi experience, for example, fourth largest earthquake in history. Uh, so this would have been a third largest earthquake in history that was analyzed in this particular analysis here. Even with that, it's a very small probability of pool leakage. In order to get that, the staff assumed the fragility or the ability for the liner to tear was more so than it actually was. They used carbon steel instead of austenitic stainless steel. Austenitic stainless steel is much more resistant to tearing than carbon steel. And they used some other conservatisms in that analysis. So they ended up with um, assuming a small probability of leakage and calculate that in the consequences here. Next slide, please. Um, you know, we, we saw earlier that at least 21 spent fuel pools have seen a seismic event more severe than their design basis earthquake to date with really no significant consequences. And as the chairman pointed out, there's been numerous studies over the last several decades, and they all really have the same conclusion that the spent fuel pools are really not a significant source of off-site dose or consequence. Um, for example, in the high-density case and low-density case, if you want to look at those two cases, for the high-density case, there are four and a half orders of magnitude of margin between what was calculated and the safety goals set by the NRC. On the high-density case, it was, on the low-density case, it was five orders of magnitude. So it's a half a order of magnitude difference between these two cases both of which well are well conserved, but much more safe than the safety requirements require. Around approximately 100,000 times safer than the goal. Next slide, please. Uh, today, all the plants in the United States have procedures to deal with loss of spent fuel pool inventory. We've always had procedures to do that. 
as a result of the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States. The security-related orders require additional safety measures to be taken. We put in place additional equipment and procedures to deal with that. Uh, and the study takes credit for those. What the study does not take credit for is now we have the flexible diverse equipment required as a result of the Fukushima plant, uh, Fukushima uh, accident at all of our facilities. We also have procedures in place to deal with this and equipment still coming on site. For example, Dominion sites, we have equipment at all the sites today to deal with that issue. Um, we're also gonna have regional support centers. The Memphis Center is already established. The Phoenix Center will be established by this uh, first half of this year. In addition to that, there's 62 other sites available to borrow equipment from to provide water. The bottom line is that uh, this is not a complicated mitigation, nor is it difficult. It's simply just add water. That's what the consequence is. That's what the, the compensatory mitigation is. Next slide, please. The NRC staff, and correctly so, used multiple layers of conservatism in their analysis. Each layer was designed to favor expedited fuel offload. Uh, even with all those conservatisms added and the favorability added to it, it didn't really result in any change here. Um, very conservative analysis were used, as I mentioned earlier, for spent fuel pool liner fragility or how easily the liner would tear. A uh, very large earthquake was used. In the high density case, mitigation was assumed. In other words, you could go in and add water easily or spray the pool down. In the low density case, mitigation was assumed to not be successful. That assumption alone adds a factor of 19 to the case difference. That's a big difference there. Next slide, please. I mentioned over the decades, there's been numerous studies that have, have analyzed the spent fuel pools, existing high density configurations, and all determined that they'd be extremely safe with considerable margin to the, to the requirements, to the safety goals. Um, we, all, we have seen a number of cases where the seismic event has exceeded the capacity designed into spent fuel pools. And we found from the North Anna earthquake, there's tremendous conservatisms even in the codes used. I'll give you a quick example. One of the non-safety buildings that houses our station blackout diesel out in North Anna, we put that earthquake into the design basis code for the building. It said the building would collapse because of the conservatisms in the design code. Now, the building did not collapse. actually had zero damage to it. The design codes have significant margins built directly into them. And this isn't an accident analysis code. This is design code. They're not, not intended to analyze accidents that occur or events that occur. It's easy to get off track and focus on the consequences of these events without looking at the probabilities. The probabilities are very, very important in this case. We're seeing numbers like one in 10 billion per year, one in a trillion per beer per, per year. These kind of numbers, engineers have a hard time saying this, but they're effectively zero. When you get that many zeros in front of a decimal point, it's effectively zero. One in a trillion is a very, very small number. Madam Chairman, that concludes. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.